Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today. This is Erin Reese, Head of Marketing for SPINS. I'm joined today by Lucy Poston, who is the founder of The Honest Kitchen. We're so excited to get to hear her story today. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you so much. I'm excited to join you. Terrific. Well, thank you. Well, let's start out with getting a little history about um, you and maybe your life before Honest Kitchen and, and uh, what got you started with it. Um, I'm from the UK originally. I've been in the US for over two decades now. Um, and I have a bachelor's degree in equine and business studies from Agricultural College in the UK. So that's horses and business management. And that kind of parlayed into my first job here in the States, uh, which was with a company that made both pet food and equine supplements. Um, and I worked for them for about five years before I actually started The Honest Kitchen. Oh, great. And, and how, so then how did the Honest Kitchen come to be? What, what was about your previous work or your life that, that had you become an entrepreneur? Well, the Honest Kitchen kind of got started a little bit by accident in some ways. I had um, got my first dog, a Rhodesian Ridgeback named Mosey, while I was working at my prior company. And I'd been feeding him um, the food and treats that, that they made, which were great quality and, you know, great company um, but he was suffering with these chronic ear infections that just would not go away and I was spending a fortune at the vet on um, ear flushes and steroids and antibiotics and all sorts of other things and it was sort of suppress the symptoms but not really bring about a true cure it just kept on flaring up every few weeks um, and so I really started thinking maybe food could be contributing to these issues and perhaps food could be the medicine as well um, and so I started doing my own homemade raw food diet with my own produce and meat um, and got amazing results in, in terms of his health and well-being. Um, his ear infections literally cleared up completely, but I managed to kind of destroy our kitchen in the process. It's just super messy dealing with lots of raw ingredients and bowls of bloody meat in the fridge and pureeing stuff. It's just really time consuming and messy. And so I was just sort of sat about thinking and how could I make this food more convenient to serve and make and the idea for dehydration popped into my head so that's basically just removing the moisture from the raw ingredients and leaving everything else intact um, so I sort of got this dehydrated idea together and decided to make a little company out of it um, and in the early days it was literally just an online business we had a, a couple of initial retailers in, in the fairly early stages um, the first one actually was a friend of mine from the dog park who I've been kind of chatting to in the evenings about what I was doing. And she'd said, well, if you ever get it off the ground, we'll carry it at the store. Um, so we got her set up, but it wasn't really ever intended to be as, as big of a business as it is today. It's sort of grown up by accident. Um, I was only 27 when we actually started the business. So I think um, back in those days, I think a 27 year old has a bit of a different outlook on life and just that kind of stubborn determination so um, there are a lot of hurdles to overcome in really getting it off the ground um, human grade is really one of the foundational um, well, the main foundational principle behind the honest kitchen every single thing we make is made according to human food production standards not pet food standards and there's a massive difference there um, but it was a big challenge trying to find human food su suppliers and then an actual human food producer that would blend my recipes for me. Um, and so there were and some regulatory issues to, to overcome along the way, but uh, finally, finally turned into the business it was meant to be. Well, congratulations. It, it's, it's amazing what you've done and how you've done it. So I'm curious to, to learn more as we have this conversation. Uh, the piece that I, I guess when we talk about uh, food, what we're eating and the ingredients in the food and things like that, we're always looking at what, what's healthy and natural. Uh, what, what's been was amazing about reading about your story uh, is, is the, the production of it too. And I don't know that consumers are necessarily as um, aware that, that that plays a big part in, in the product, the end product as well. Yeah, it does. It's it's something that we try to talk about without becoming overly consume, confusing with it. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation in the pet food industry. And so as a general rule, a new consumer is trying to sort of sort through 
you know, what's fact and what's fiction about different brands that they might be considering. Um, so we try not to sort of be too overwhelming by launching into the intricate details of our production methods. But at the same time, we do love telling that story about dehydration, how it's much gentler than conventional production methods like canning and extrusion. It's really very delicate. Um, so we try to do as little as possible to our raw ingredients in order to maintain the nutritional integrity and the vibrancy, those beautiful phytonutrients that exist in the raw ingredients. Those all have a direct tangible impact on pet health and well-being, just as it does in human nutrition. Um, so we, we have that information available, but it, we don't always sort of lead with it. We lead with the human grade piece in terms of quality and integrity. Um, and then there's all these different sort of layers of other things that make up our brand DNA and our, our products. Great. And when you look at ingredients and how you got started, is there, because I've, I've always been a pet owner, but uh, I'll be open in saying that I haven't always you know, understood what were the best things for them. Uh, is it much different than what it is for humans? And how did you learn what pets needed that, that made them perform better, be healthier, um, their, their wellness factors? Yeah, it's not terribly different from human nutrition in many ways. I think um, a lot of pet food brands tend to sort of overcomplicate it or they root their ideology so much in science rather than sort of common sense, good, good nutrition, good food, good sense. Um, and there are some brands who tend to sort of focus overly on that science and almost intimidate people that um, feeding their dog or cat is this sort of overly complicated process. I think as a brand, The Honest Kitchen, we really focus on common sense nutrition, you know, if you, if you eat a healthy, colorful, whole food diet, you're going to feel better. That's just sort of a, a known fact. And our pets are the exact same way. Um, on the pet food side, we have sort of this regulatory agency called AFCO, which comes up with nutritional profiles. So we have to meet those profiles in terms of um, vitamins and minerals and protein and fat levels and that sort of thing. Um, so it's about 22 different nutrients that we have to meet in our recipes. Um, but we really think about nutrition in, in different terms. We're very big advocates of dietary variety. Um, we are fans of cracking an egg or a spoonful of yogurt into your dog's food to sort of mix things up a little bit rather than just feeding this sort of brown monotonous meal of sort of the equivalent of Captain Crunch for every meal. I'm feeling like a bad pet, pet parent right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that that's amazing and and so you this 100% human grade you seem like you're really um, championing it looks like being the champion of that standard. Uh, and, and trying to, obviously you not only practice it with The Honest Kitchen and all of your products, but it seems like for the industry, you're um, a champion for that and, and almost you're welcoming more people to, to be embracing this. That's absolutely right. Yeah, we were the first ever sort of truly human grade product on the market almost two decades ago now. Um, we had to go through a lot of regulatory hoops in order to make that a reality. Um, from the get-go, I had selected 100% human food suppliers who were selling ingredients directly into the human food supply chain and a human food manufacturing facility. Um, and as we started to grow and expand, we had to um, apply for licenses in each individual state. And unfortunately, the state of New Mexico sent back my whole product regis registration and labels and said, you can't register this product in our state and you can't sell it here until you take the human grade wording off your labels. And I said, well, it actually truly is human grade. So I feel like I should be allowed to say that. And they said, no, you definitely cannot unless you get you were to get FDA approval to say it. And nobody's ever done that. But, you know, that that would be the only way we'd ever even consider accepting it. And I just said, okay, what's their phone number? <laughs> and just got in touch with the FDA, the Center of Veterinary Medicine, and sort of explained my predicament. And they're like, well, you're going to have to document your whole supply chain and all of your manufacturing, and you'll have to go through basically a pre-approval process for all your labels before we would even do anything like that. We've never done it before. And so it was this really long, protracted situation. FDA, as I think 
similar to many government agencies, has weeks of, of time to get back to you uh, to your every question. So that they, they would reply to me, and I'd fire off another email with documentation or whatever it was they were asking for, and then it would be this long twelve week wait for them to get back to me with their next comment. Um, so it was pretty frustrating and. Um, and by that time, I got a newborn baby, so it was. I've got some pretty bittersweet memories of that period of time. It was pretty stressful, um, but yes, it, eventually that happened. We got that statement of no objection from the federal FDA, and then we've been able to use that subsequently in each state, except for Ohio, who didn't didn't acknowledge it. We had to sue them to get our our human grade approved in their state. Um, but it's something that I truly believe in. There are massive differences between the quality and integrity and safety standards in a human food production facility versus a pet food rendering plant. Um, and it's something I really wanted to highlight as part of our brand fabric. Um, and it has been a goal to sort of raise the bar in terms of quality standards across the whole industry and do something tangibly better and different. And I do see it as sort of a mark of our success that we've now got sort of imitators and um, other companies who are doing something really cool and very similar in terms of a better product. Wow, well, congratulations, and we, we all applaud and appreciate your tenacity, so now we have much healthier food to give our, our pets. Um, and, in, and to the point you're just making, I think on your website it said that uh, pet standards, there's only like 15, whereas for human grade, it, there's 100 in, in the manufacturing side. That's exactly right, yeah, just the, the way that human food production is set up in terms of documentation and record keeping and swabbing of um, air conditioning and ventilation and drains and everything for ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate or one of the indicators of bacterial contamination. All of that stuff is literally built into our manufacturing as though a human child were going to eat the finished product. Um, and so it's just much safer. And then even on the ingredient side, the, the types of ingredients that end up in a lot of pet foods are really quite disturbing. I mean, there's beaks and feet and feathers and all sorts of horrible things that, that end up in pet food and they are perfectly legal to be used in the industry. And so we really wanted, I really wanted to sort of just distance ourselves from that. Well, great job. Um, so in listening to you, it sounds like a lot of this happened early on in, in your, your journey and you've been at this a, a long time so what are those were your early challenges and, and you've grown exponentially obviously since then any other um you know, how did how did your journey you know, evolve and and where do you sit today and and how are your priorities different potentially or, or maybe the same yeah well we've grown from being just me and the dog in the spare bedroom and packing up stuff to ship out from my garage to being a company of almost 50 people today um, so we've got sort of a proper brand and, you know, really widely expanded product line. We're continuing to innovate. We've got some beautiful new treats that will be coming out in the next few months. Um, our clusters is a brand new product. It's a, it's a human grade dry food that's made with a combination of um, roasting or toasting and dehydration. Um, so very different. It looks um, visually very different from the conventional sort of pet food pellets that many people are used to. Um, so we're continuing to do that and I think the big focus, particularly for me as founder and chief integrity officer of the company, is continuing to make sure that we always continue to live by our, um, our values and ethics and our, our sort of basic standards of decency that we've always lived by, making sure that those always continue to apply even as we grow and evolve as a brand. Great. So to your example of your new innovation, how, how does that come about? How are you... You, are you watching the market? Are you watching trends? Are you listening to your customer? How are you identifying where you're going to innovate next or what that looks like and how you do it? We get ideas from all over the place. Um, sometimes it's, it's quite strategic. We do an annual benchmarking survey with our customers and we, we've always prided ourselves on having this kind of bi-directional dialogue with our most passionate customers in terms of getting their feedback and their thoughts on different things that we're doing and, and thinking about doing. Um, so they're incredibly influential in terms of how we 
see the future. Um, and we take the human analog is really our sort of inspiration. So for example, a couple of years ago, we came up with a golden milk for dogs, uh, which was a very trendy product on the human food side. It's obviously an ancient um, beverage from, from long ago and, and rooted in Ayurvedic principles, but um, we've sort of found ways to translate that into something that would be beneficial for an animal because of course a dog or a cat's body can benefit just as much from things like turmeric and its anti-inflammatory properties as a human cat. Um, so we love to take that sort of inspiration. Um, sometimes we'll just have sort of a wild idea or we, we just we look at um, different human food trends that are happening uh, on that side of things and, and think about how we could translate them. And that's great. It's interesting. It, it spins um, now, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but we're about to launch our, a, a, a pet channel. So where we bring together a, a wealth of retailers uh, data and being able to really see uh, what the trends are, what's happening. And, and one of the things that Spins does that's, that's unique to us is our product intelligence. And we you know, capture everything on the bag, we capture all the ingredients, and, and then we overlay you know, attributes and really are able to watch what's happening. So as you talk about the turmeric, what's happening there, um, lots of plant-based trends from, from the um, human side. And, um, uh, we're seeing a lot more um, like with m mushrooms as a functional ingredient mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And, um, you know, curious to see how that's now going to play out in, in the pet space too. And it sounds like you guys are already pioneering on that front as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think continuing to innovate um, with um, sustainability issues at the forefront as well. So thinking how can we create products that really elevate our standing, how can we use our brand voice and our purchasing power to do things that sort of make a positive impact in terms of, we just created a new line of um, fish treats that are made with 100% MSC certified fish skins and things like that. So um, being able to be sort of a force for good beyond, um, beyond the immediate benefits. That's great. Yes, that is another one we're seeing a lot, a lot more of the sustainability pieces and, and not just in packaging. And, and I think people are need to be more educated too on, on what that means in the broader sense. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's it just, it is that process of using products to be educational and to help sort of raise awareness about different things that some people may not even consider. Terrific. One of the things you mentioned that um, it was interesting to me too in, in doing my research is you, you talked about your voice to the customer and I see you have a rewards program and I know in uh, the manufacturing world it's, it's kind of hard to, to do programs like that and, and actually know who your customer is and be able to speak to them firsthand. So would that program help in doing that or were you doing it prior? Um, curious how that's playing into your strategy as well. Yeah, we've had that program in, in various different iterations for many years. Um, it used to be a really rudimentary system where people, there would be sort of a, an envelope that lived under the counter at the retailer and people would just bring in their receipts or their proof of purchase in terms of a UPC code and save them up. And then we would sort of manually give them their free product and reimburse the retailer. And it's gradually become more um, digitized over the years. Um, and so we've, we've now got it in its current iteration of buy 10, get one free. And we've, it's a pretty competitive program and it's a great way to kind of um, really enhance and um, deepen that brand loyalty. We're fortunate that our products really do speak for themselves in many ways. And so we've got that very natural brand loyalty. Um, the Honest Kitchen is, a, is a, a brand that often gets sort of propagated by word of mouth as much of an, as anything else. Um, so people literally try the food, see the benefits on their pet, and then start to tell their friends. Um, but having the rewards program is a way to kind of really kind of solidify that a little bit too. Uh, that's terrific. And, and I saw that people get can be incented by giving your the stories to you guys and you're highlighting them on your site, which is just amazing. You can get lost in all the all the amazing stories you have there. Um, but I, I suspect that you are getting people to give you feedback well before you had to reward them to do it. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, the, the true stories part of the website has been, that's been in existence for a few years now. Um, and it's been a really cool way for people just to literally highlight the success that they've seen in using the brand and, you know, giving that feedback. And it's, it's something that's a really cool resource for other people to, 
to read about as well when it's it's authentic and it's um, natural and people just um, say what they want to say and upload photos of their dogs so it's a really cool little uh, ecosystem over there. Terrific. Well, thank you. Um, and I guess a question because we did mention, obviously, we're I'm represented for spins and, and you guys are a client of ours and you know, data plays a, a role in how you make your decisions, especially more from you. Know, we've talked a lot about how you're developing your product and developing the brand, but getting it out in front of new customers and and building more engagement and, and ultimately more sales. You know, how do you, uh, you know, how do you view that and what's your approach or are there certain I don't know lessons that you've learned through the through the years of, of where you hone in and to for the your best success yeah it's definitely something that has become more and more of a priority as time has gone on and we've as we've continued to grow and expand um, back in the early days I think we relied a lot more on um, instinct. I'm a, a pretty intuitive person and I tend to kind of just act on gut. That's my, my default position. But obviously as we've continued to evolve as a brand, there's a lot more at stake. Um, and so balancing that instinct with insights has been tremendous for us. And so getting those data points about the competitive landscape and seeing where, what sort of other things consumers are prioritizing and focusing on. I think we're in an age where people are becoming more and more aware of um, the direct effects between pet health and the food that they, that they consume or the food that they're feeding their companion animal. Um, there's also a heightened awareness about non-GMOs and organic ingredients, the MSC and free range and gap and on all of those different certifications, people are really sort of tuned into that now, much more so than in, in years gone by. Um, but having information from spins and, and other resources like that gives us that really invaluable data that helps to inform our decisions. Sometimes we'll just do things and, and act on sort of whimsy, but um, for the most part now, everything that we do is really rooted in having that excellent data set. It, it helps the gut check, right? <laughs> It, well, that, it certainly seems like you've done very, really, really well on your instincts, uh, just every, everything you've grown and built so far. So, you know, and kudos to you. Um, I've taken a lot of your time, but can I steal one more, one more question? Um, oh, yeah. we, we, I love to ask, uh, what have you learned now that you wish you would have known then as kind of a pay it forward question to other people who are um, you know, getting started and, and wanting to do something new and exciting? Um, I, there are a few things, I think. Um, at The Honest Kitchen, we've been tremendously fortunate to have amazing investors by our side with um, Alliance Consumer Growth out of New York and White Road Investments who are up in the Bay Area. Um, so they've been incredible partners to us. I think we spent probably in some ways too long sort of hesitating on the brink of taking on investment and in in some ways i'm glad that we that we did wait for a long time because it really allowed us to kind of establish who we were from sort of a brand fabric level without being overly influenced um and i think my advice on that side of things would be just ask really great questions of your investors and and really drill into who they are and do they share your vision and, and are they aligned with your values? And we've been so fortunate with our investors that, that we have them literally in lockstep with us. And we, we have had for um, many years, almost a decade now. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, I think some other pieces of advice um, that I received over the years, um, one was to um, focus on, uh, what one of our investors is, um, Sean Parr from Bulldog Drummond, which is a marketing agency, and he's been a mentor to me for many years prior to actually investing in the company. He told me to um, really focus on what he called Uber users. And this was so long ago that Uber wasn't even a thing. So it's nothing to do with that. Um, but an Uber user is basically someone who's like a really early adopter and incredibly passionate and then in turn influential. So how could we put programs in place that would really empower them sharing new product ideas and mailing them product samples before something even comes to an existence to get their feedback um, and then giving them the tools to influence other people in turn. So it might be sort of dog walkers or vet techs or other people that just love our brand and have got love to share about it. Um, he also really coached me to be a more visible leader than I was probably comfortable with back in the early days. Um, 
I think I was so focused on building the brand, but he sort of really pushed me beyond my comfort level to become more more visible and be a spokesperson for the brand and and in so doing to really enhance the honest kitchen's accountability so that ultimately sort of the buck stops with me as the the founder of the organization and i think that gives people a much deeper level of trust that they can see we're not just sort of this mysterious organization in a in a warehouse in nebraska we love to sort of show who we are behind the scenes and and have that visibility um, and then there's an, another piece of advice, which I think is absolutely terrible that did not come from um, anybody that I've mentioned so far in the interview. It was literally a, a stranger that I met at a conference one time and I ended up getting into a bit of a debate with him about how to grow a business. And, and he said to me, his advice was, you know, your problem is you just love your business too much. And I just, I was really taken aback by it. And I was like, of course I do. Um, and I think to me, he thought that just loving the business so much held you back from growing and chasing dollars and all of that sort of thing. And to me, loving the business is the most important thing. And I think that love and care for what we're doing and the passion for it uh, is really the dynamo that drives us in being able to constantly keep stepping forward towards our true north. Um, and I see it in other entrepreneurs that I mentor nowadays having that passion and, and love for what they're doing is what drives things forward and enables you to to do well by doing good. Yeah, I, I love that last piece and thanks for sharing it because I've heard similar people use that same advice and uh, that you you get blinded with that passion. Um, and and I, I certainly can see how that happens, but it, it, it seems like it works out better most of the time the other way, the way, the way I, you're doing I, yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. And I think, again, that that goes back to having good investors who are sort of patient money and willing to kind of do the right thing the right way and plan for the long term versus just kind of um, grabbing it, grabbing at the next shiny thing. Yeah. Well, terrific. This this was amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you very much for asking me. It's, uh, I love to love to tell the story. So thank you very much. And congratulations on all your accomplishments. It's an amazing thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you.